This video is on lecture 14, which is random variables, distribution, and expectation. So let's get started. The first subject is random variables. So I'm not going to introduce the definition immediately, but I'm going to set it up with an example. So let's say we have a bookshelf with three cubbies which are spaces for three books. Uh, and let's say these cubbies are labeled one, two, and three here. And let's also assume that we have three books, book one, book two, and book three, which are going to go into these cubbies in some order. Now, let's say that book one belongs in cubby one, book two belongs in cubby two, and book three belongs in cubby three, but we're just going to distribute them randomly across this, so any book could end up in any given cubby. So, we know that there are three bang different ways that we can uh, place these, why are you doing that? books across these shelves. So there's three bang permutations, which tells us that the sample space, which is uh, all possible results of placing these three books, is going to have a cardinality, which is three bang, which is six. So let's actually enumerate all those permutations right here. So um, the possibilities are one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three, one, three, one, two, three, two, one. So these are uh, the three factorial uh, possibilities here. And e the, the digit represents what cubby it's in, and the number that's there represents, uh, represents what book is in there. So in uh, for this, for example, in uh, for two one three, book two is in cubby one, book uh, one is in cubby two, book three is in cubby three. So now let's imagine that we define some function x of omega, where omega is a member of big omega, which is some sample point. Which these are all the sample points. These are all the omegas. So let's define x of omega, some function on omega, to be the number of fixed points in omega. Uh, so what does a fixed point mean? A fixed point is a book that's in its cubby. So a book that's in the right slot. In if So if one were in one, that would be a fixed point. So let's actually enumerate what x of omega is for all these omegas. So here it's three because all the books are in the right place. Here only one is in the right place. Here none of them are in the right place. Or actually, sorry, three is in the right place. Here none of them are in the right place. Here none of them are in the right place. And here two is in the right place. So so this is the x of omega value for all these sample points omega. So what I'm going to tell you now is that x is actually a random variable. So x is a random variable. And that may not make much sense right now, but we're going to define what a random variable is exactly. So the definition of a random variable is a random variable x on a sample space omega is a function, uh, as you could tell, x of omega was a function on omega, that assigns a real 
number x of omega to each sample point omega that is in omega. So clearly x of omega is a random variable because for every sample point in omega, which there were six, the, namely d6, uh, x of omega assigned some number uh, to, to each sample point. So um, it, it may take a little while of getting used to exactly what a random variable is. So uh, I'm going to throw out another random, a uh, few random variables. It's actually rather uh, a non-intuitive description saying the word random variable. It, it's a function and it's a mapping. And uh, the word random variable maybe doesn't do it justice. But uh, I'm, I'm going to define, let's say, another random variable y. Uh, let's define y to be equal to the value in the first cubby minus the value in the second cubby plus the value in the third cubby. So again, this is an arbitrary random, uh, random variable y that I've created. Uh, just to kind of give another example of a random variable and show you that uh, they can be relatively arbitrary. It's not like uh, you have to do anything special. So here it's going to be 1 uh, minus 2 is negative 1 plus 3 is 2. 1 minus 3 is negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And uh, then you get 4. Then you get 0. Then you get 4 again. And now you get 2. Now let's talk about the range of uh, these random variables. It's a pretty small set as you can see. But the range, let's call it phi, of x of omega, so phi sub x, is uh, it takes on the values 0, 1, and 3. And for y, let's say this is phi sub y, it's equal to 0, 2, and 4. These are the possible values that x of omega and y of omega can take on. And as you can see, this is a discrete set of possibilities. So x and y are discrete random variables. Now, we're not going to be talking about continuous random variables for a while. So you can pretty much assume we're talking about discrete random variables from here on out. So given this definition here, and also the same thing that I've depicted here graphically, we can see that x or any random variable is a mapping between the sample space and, and its domain which is some set of values here denoted to be a. So uh, it, for our particular example, we had, uh, we had these uh, little shelves with these cubbies with uh, books going into them. So 3, 1, 2 had a mapping to 0 because everything was out of, uh, out of order. 1, 2, 3 had a mapping to 3. 2, 3, 1 also has a mapping to 0. Uh, 1, 3, 2 has a mapping to 1 because the 1 is in place. 2, 1, 3 has a mapping to 1 because the 3 is in place. 3, 2, 1 has a mapping to 1 because the 2 is in place. And that's pretty much how everything maps out. So you can see that, that a random variable is just a mapping. So let's move on to the next portion, which is on distributions. So um, let's, let's start off by giving an analogy. Uh, basically, we remember that a probability space had two different things which defined it. Uh, it was defined by one, uh, with omega, which is the sample space, which were, if you don't remember, all possible outcomes. And the second one was a probability associated with each omega that was in omega. Now we're going to use this definition of a probability space to uh, give an analogous definition to what uh, defines a random variable. So Aside from the definition given above, we're going to I'm here going to give you the components of a random variable rather than just w the definition of a random variable. So a random variable is defined by 1, 
the values it can take. So that is its range, which for, uh, for now what we're, as I said, we're dealing with is a discrete set. And then the second thing that it's defined by is the probability with which it takes on those values. So I said I was going to be talking about distributions. And I haven't so far. I've been rambling on some more about random variables. And I'm going to sort of keep dodging uh, distribution for a little bit longer. And we'll come back around to it. So I'm going to define A to be some event. A is the event where for omega in big omega out of the possible outcomes, x of omega equals a. Now, why can I say this is an event? Because, well, first of all, we know that a is going to be a some subset of omega in which the members of a, the little omega in a, uh, when, when the function x is applied to them, they're going to result in the value a. So this is clearly going to be a subset of big omega, but l let's actually look at an actual example of this event A, and then I promise we'll get around to distributions. So let's say um, the omega in the sample space omega we defined earlier, such that x of omega equals 1. So remember, now we're referring to the actual example we did earlier, uh, w uh, earlier above. So this set is basically, what it's saying is, when is the number of terms that's in the correct place, the number of books that, that's in the right cubby, equal to 1? So we got this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. So now you can, now you can really see that this is a subset of omega, and uh, therefore an event. So this corresponds to uh, 1, 3, 2. 2, 1, 3, and 3, 2, 1. These are the three events. Uh, the, these are the three uh, sample points which sap satisfy this condition that x of omega equals 1. So now let's get around to computing the probability of a. Well, this is something we know how to do previously. The probability of a is equal to the sum of each of the points in A, uh, the probability of their happening. So none of these is privileged over the other. They're all equally likely to happen. They have one over three factorial chance of happening. So because there's three of them, we're going to get uh, one over six plus one over six plus one over six, which is equal to a one half chance of the event A taking place. Uh, essentially, a one half chance of one book, a 50% chance of one of the books being in the correct place. Now, similarly, we can define that the probability of x equaling 0, basically the function, the random variable x being 0, or rather the x of omega, though that's that uh, we drop that notation because it's too much to write. Um, so the the probability that x is zero is one third, and I didn't really show why that's the case, but you can see that two out of the six uh, give you an x of omega that's zero. So that that kind of makes sense. Again, the probability that x equals one we just computed is one over two, and the probability that x equals 2 is 1 over 6. And that's the case where all three are in the correct place. There's only one of them. Uh, so clearly, the probability of that occurring is 1 over 6. So now, all of this together, all this information right here, gives you the distribution of the random variable x. So it gives you the probability of x uh, being a certain number a, and it gives you the number a as well. So 
This right here is defined as the distribution over x. And I actually forgot to add one last thing in order to complete the distribution. And that is that the probability of x equals a is 0 for all a not equal to 0, 1, and 3. So now we've got a complete distribution uh, over x. So let's notice a couple things um, about this distribution. One is that any two events, x equals a1 and x equals a2, are disjoint if a1 not equal to a2. That is to say that there's no overlap over the events x equals a1 and x equals a2 because based on the definition of, uh, of a random variable, we know that, uh, that each omega in the sample space is going to be mapped to just one real number. So any two sample points that are mapped to different numbers, a1 and a2, are going to have to be two different sample points. This should be pretty clear that the same random variable can't be mapped to both a1 and a2. So now that we know that the sets are disjoint, a consequence of that is that the union of all these events a in phi is going to give you the sample space omega because uh, let's just write this more clearly a phi of x equals a the union of all these events that x equals a where a spans all the possible uh, values the range of the random variable is going to give you the sample space omega because you're taking the union of all these disjoint sets that are comprised of a bunch of sample points from omega so uh, you're, you know that if you take the union over all of them you're going to get omega which also implies that the sum of the probabilities of each of these a in phi is going to be equal to 1 because we know that the sum over the probabilities of the events in the sample space, uh, of the sample points in the sample place rather, add up to 1. Now we're going to get into a particular type of distribution, which is the binomial distribution. So uh, in order to set this up, let's say we have a type of action we're going to take B which has two possible outcomes. Uh, it has an outcome 1 and an outcome 0, and it'll have 1 with probability p, and it'll come out to 0 as a result with probability 1 minus p. So this is just to set the stage for binomial distributions. So let's just suppose that uh, you do Beta. Beta is an action that you're taking um, n times. So you take this action beta, which has these has this probability uh, n different times, and our uh, random variable x is the number of ones uh, from taking action from from taking those actions or equivalently the sum of the outcomes or whatever. So uh, suppose we wanted to know the probability that our random variable x equals i, uh, some given i. So we clearly definitely have the tools to solve such a problem. So uh, the probability that you get a certain i number of ones uh, after doing this action beta n times is, um, well, you know that you're going to have to get n, uh, you're going to have to get 1, which has probability p, 
i different times. So you're going to have a p to the i term in there. And then naturally, you're also going to have a 1 minus p to the n minus i term as well in there because the action you're going to have to get uh, n minus i zeros in order to get p ones. So this has a probability 1 minus p of happening. So you have to get that term in there. But this doesn't cover it because there's a whole a variety of different ways that you can get uh, i ones. So you're going to have to say, OK, there's n choose i different ways to go about doing this. So this is the expression for the probability of x equaling uh, some number i. So this equation right here essentially is our binomial distribution, which we're going to denote as x, which is the random variable, is a binomial distribution. Uh, depending on n and p. And I, I've given a graph here of two different binomial distributions with different n and different p's. So uh, this one is a binomial distribution where n is 9 so and p is 1 over 2. Because p is 1 over 2, we can model this as uh, flipping coins where, say, heads is 1 and tails is 0. And we're basically, we're flipping 9 coins, and you're saying, what's the expected number of heads? And uh, the answer is, uh, intuitively, you know it's going to be uh, more often f around four or five heads, and less often zero heads or nine heads or, or any of the other numbers. So that's the binomial distribution you get uh, just by plugging n equals 9, p equals 1 over 2 in here, or imagining flipping coins or whatever. Um, and then this is the binomial distribution for when n is a really large number, and uh, the probability of getting a 1 is very small. So now if you're summing all these up, you're likely to, st you're likely to get uh, smaller numbers. Uh, you're not, you're, pro you're not gonna, definitely not going to get 0. Or uh, not definitely, you're almost certainly not going to get 0. Uh, you're less likely, you're not very likely to get such small numbers. But around here it peaks. And your likelihood of getting n is almost nothing, although it obviously could happen. It's just incredibly unlikely based on p being small, the probability of getting a 1 being small. So the reason we like the binomial distribution is that we can model a lot of different things this way. You already heard uh, tossing coins, and I'm sure you can imagine a bunch of other things. But I'm going to uh, say let's remodel sending uh, a message which might have errors across a channel in terms of this binomial distribution. So uh, here what we can say is um, let's now call this same beta um, uh, let's say it's a packet received or a packet lost and usually we define uh, the probability of losing a packet. So we're going to say the packet lost is with probability p, and the packet uh, received is probability 1 minus p. So you know that everything we've done here with p and 1 minus p, you're going to need to invert the two, uh, flip them around, and you'll, you'll get the same result. So let's say we're sending a message of length equal to n. And we want to know what uh, if the probability of dropping a packet is p, and x equals the number of packets received. We want to know what the probability that of actually getting our message across is. That's the probability that x is greater than or equal to n, because we know that n points is uh, what's going to specify our message. So we can say this in terms of this binomial distribution. We can say um, this is actually going to be a sum, because in order to get uh, greater than or equal to n packets across, not exactly equal to n, uh, you, have, you can either get i going from n packets all the way to n plus k if all of the packets get through safely that is still that's still greater than or equal to n 
Uh, and then from here, you're just plugging in N plus K packets is the one you is are the ones you're setting. I of them have to get through. So you're saying N plus K choose I. And now uh, again, I said you're gonna have to switch one, a P and one minus P. So you have a one minus P probability of those I packets getting through multiplied by a P probability of N plus K, which is the number of packets you're sending, minus those I uh, getting dropped. So now we've remodeled uh, this problem of sending messages across a, uh, across a noisy channel, which has a possibility of packet loss in terms of a binomial distribution. And here, uh, this in particular was uh, modeled as a binomial distribution uh, based depending on n and oh, sorry n plus k and p. Uh, so what and according to our shorthand notation, we would call this x is binomial according to n plus k and I remember the role of p and one minus p are switched one minus p. So distributions are great in that they give us all the information uh, about a random variable, but they can often be hard to compute. For example, let's say we scaled up uh, the original case of putting books into different cubbies to a case where there were 20 different cubbies and therefore 20 bang possibilities for uh, in the sample space, then it becomes a little harder to uh, compute an explicit distribution across all uh, possibilities, across all numbers for um, for, for, for that case. So uh, that leads us to the notion of an expectation, which is the mean or average uh, of a random variable, which can be computed from the distribution, but uh, we'll find that there's a better way to, there's an easier way to compute it, and that it's often a very helpful way of looking at a random variable. So the distribution of a random variable is uh, all the values that the random variable can take on, um, those that variable itself multiplied by the probability of that random variable being a. So again, phi is the all possible vowels of the random variable. Just to be clear. Um, so now uh, let's let's actually look at some concrete examples. So what's the uh, expected number? of books in your that'll be in the correct cubby book book that'll be in their own cubby right uh, well we know that uh, the that there's a one-third chance that zero of them will be in their own cubby there is a, a one-half chance that one of them will be in the right one and there's a one-sixth chance that three of them will be in the right cubby. So this is one. So the expected number of books to be in their own cubby is equal to one. Let's uh, compute a, a, a no, another one. What's the expected value of rolling one fair die? Well, you should already have a fair idea of what this is going to be. But uh, nevertheless, let's, let's compute it. So we know that every roll of the die has a 1 6 probability of happening. So we've got 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. And just make sure that you realize that this is the same equation where I've pulled out the probability of each of them happening and uh, summed the, the va actual values A. Uh, so this comes out to be 21 over 6, which can be simplified to be 7 over 2. Now hopefully that's what you uh, expected it to be. So uh, when you roll a die, next time you roll a die, you can expect the value 3.5 to, to be the one that's rolled. Now obviously uh, that's a joke and that's ridiculous, but uh, over a number of rolls you should, uh, the, you should expect to uh, have it average out to be um, 3.5. So what's the average value of rolling two fair die? Well, this actually turns out to be a bit tedious to compute 
uh, and we'll actually learn a better way to compute this in a few minutes. But basically, you're enumerating all the things in the sample space and seeing what, uh, what the value came out to. So there's a 136 chance of rolling, uh, of when you roll two die, of getting a two, and so on and so forth. You can see most of the probability is concentrated around six, seven, and eight, and that's sort of what you would expect. So uh, what we're gonna get from, by doing that is this calculation of the expected value, which is uh, again corresponds to this same equation. Just check that you see that, and then what it comes out basically to is seven. So the expected value of rolling two fair die is seven. All right, now I think it's about time for a theorem. So let's give you a theorem regarding uh, expected value. And that is for any two random variables, v, uh, x, and y, on the same probability space. So it's pretty important that they be on the same probability space. You can say that e of x, sorry, big x, e of x plus y is equal to e of x plus e of y. And e of cx is equal to c e of x. Now this may, may, may not make perfect sense right now, but it'll make sense in a minute. But uh, those of you who, uh, there's probably a number of you who have recognized this, um, that this is just saying that the expectation is linear. The expected value uh, is, is a linear operator. So um, let's compute again the expected value of rolling two dice, and I said it was going to get a lot easier. Uh, this is the theorem that's going to get it, make it much easier for us. And we're going to look at it in terms of both of these, and hopefully it'll clarify what this theorem is actually saying. So we can look at this in terms of this is the uh, this is actually two times the expected value, uh, or sorry, this is the expected value of two times rolling one die. So that can be written written as two times e of for short, let's just say x, which is equal to two times 3.5, which is seven. <coughs> let's also look at it in another way. This is the expected value of rolling one die plus rolling one die again. And now this is taking advantage of the first part of the theorem, which is e of x again, I'm saying for short, plus e of x, uh, which is equal to 7 over 2 plus 7 over 2, which is 7 again. So the three ways of tackling it uh, gave us the same answer. And as you can see, these two are significantly easier than anything we were doing before. Now I'm going to do one last example, but uh, I haven't covered all the examples in the notes. They're all they're pretty easy, so I encourage you to look at a couple of them and uh, just parse through them yourselves. Of finding a distribution for how many fixed points there would be if we were trying to put, uh, if we were arranging twenty different books uh, into twenty cubbies. So. Uh, in case this books into cubbies example isn't resonating with you, you can also imagine that a professor is passing back homeworks to 20 students, but he passes them out completely randomly, and the fixed points are when the actual student gets their homework back. So let's see how easy it is to compute the expected value of this. Well, e of x uh, is going to be equal to e of x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 plus x20 where each of these is uh, the each of these x is the random variable which is one when student uh, i which is the subscript here gets uh, gets their homework back and zero otherwise so basically uh, I'm, I'm just going to restate x sub i is equal to one if student i, or back to the books example, shall cubby i, doesn't really matter, gets paper back, their own paper, 
and zero otherwise. So um, we know that the expected value uh, of the expected number of fixed points is the expected uh, number for each of these summed together. So this is going to be the expectation for x1 to get uh, their homework back plus x2 to get their homework back plus all the way to uh, the expect expectation for the 20th student to actually get their own homework back. So we also know that e of x1 equals e of x2. None of these is none of these students or cubbies is privileged over the other. Uh, they all have equal probability of uh, getting their own homework back. So, and that's equal to 1 over 20. They have a 1 in 20 chance of ending up with their own homework. So uh, basically we get that e of x, the expected number of fixed points, is equal to 20, which is the number of terms here, times the, probabil the expected value of each of them, which is 1 over 20. So we get 1. So we noticed that this is actually the same case as when there were three students in three homeworks or three books in three cubbies. So uh, you can do these calculations for a bunch of different numbers and you can see that the number of fixed points is equal to, always equal to n. So no matter how many uh, values you have, you, you are you're in, in, get, in increasing the size of your bookshelf or increasing the number of students you have, you increase the number of possible permutations uh, of passing back papers or arranging the books, but uh, you also um, increase the likelihood that one of them gets it back and the expectation is that one of them will get their own homework back no matter what.